Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Strategies for Creating a Respectful Workplace, brought to you by MnDOT, Office of Civil Rights. Thank you for taking time out and being here. Presenting will be myself, Alexis Johnson, Contract Compliance Specialist for Districts 6, 7, and 8, that's Southern Minnesota, Asela Sitlali Gomez, Contract Compliance Specialist for Districts 1 and 2, Northern Minnesota, and Byron Malay, Contract Compliance Lead for the Metro. We are recording today's presentation. It will be posted on our website. We will also send out a copy of the slides after the presentation. This webinar is an extension of the Respectful Workplace Guide that MnDOT and its stakeholders developed to address disrespectful behaviors on project sites, which you should have received a couple days ago. The document also can be found on the MnDOT Office of Civil Rights webpage. Today, we'll be providing more depth and research to the content on that guide. Our goal today is to provide you with the tools and best practices you can use to improve workplace culture. First, I will briefly touch on what a respectful workplace is and why it matters, including why it's just good business. Then, Asela and Byron will cover some strategies to help improve workplace culture on job sites. If you have questions, please type them in the comment box anytime throughout the presentation. We will address them at the end. Okay, let's dive in. Respectful workplace. A respectful workplace is a safe place of employment that is inclusive and welcoming to all, where employees show consideration for the rights and feelings of others. This obviously covers discriminatory behavior. However, respect goes beyond legally protected rights. It also includes respect for a safe work environment, physical safe space and belongings, different opinions, and others' privacy. When assessing your own workplace, certain factors may indicate it could use improvement. One place to look at is grievances or complaints. What do they say or allege? Is there a pattern? And I do want to note that a lack of complaints does not mean everything is going well. It could actually mean the opposite, either that employees don't know the process or they don't feel comfortable filing complaints. If employees are filing complaints, it means they have faith in the system. Other areas to look at. Um, are workers requesting transfers from particular work groups or crews? Is there a disproportionate turnover rate among certain groups? Are you seeing employees with poor productivity, low morale, or chronic absenteeism? Those that are bullied tend to bear emotional injury, which manifests in declining productivity, loss of morale, and increased absenteeism. This can also lead to an employee becoming withdrawn or isolated or experiencing more workplace injuries. Have you witnessed or become aware of employees using insensitive jokes, remarks, or writings? I want to stress that you should get out on the job site and check the area, especially restrooms and porta potties, because we have actually heard of instances where racial slurs have been written or carved in the restrooms. Now we'll look at why it matters, the business case for a respectful workplace. Besides being the morally right thing to do, Having a respectful workplace impacts your business. The most recent annual survey by the AGC of Minnesota found that 85% of respondents said the availability of workforce impacts business negatively. The respondents also said one of the top positive factors for engagement or retention of new hires is good company culture. As I'm sure you are well aware, there's becoming a construction workforce shortage and it is becoming more difficult to find good workers. You want to be able to attract and retain the best talent out there. This means recruiting a diverse and talented workforce that represents Minnesota. So what does that look like? When looking at the talent pool, like the rest of the country, Minnesota is experiencing an aging workforce. You will see somewhere around a 45% increase of people over 65 by 2030. At the same time, we will continue to see a racial demographic shift in the workforce. Even though people of color make up 20% of our population, 32% of Minnesotans aged 0 to 4 are people of color. And Minnesota has the ninth highest rate of population growth among people of color since 2010 at 29%. This graph illustrates this shift. The bars go from youngest at the bottom to oldest at the top. The red indicates white and green indicates people of color. As you can see, 
our youngest demographics are significantly more diverse than our older demographics. So as these younger Minnesotans grow into the workforce, your companies will be recruiting from a racially and culturally diverse talent pool, something many of you are likely already experiencing. So to reiterate, the construction industry needs to recruit from diverse talent pools. Unfortunately, some construction work sites are not prepared to cope with changes that come with workplace diversification, which can result in disrespectful behavior around cultural, social, and gender differences. MnDOT Office of Civil Rights is focused on diversity in race and gender, as well as other protected classes. However, employers should also be aware of the importance and challenges of other types of diversity, including political affiliations, cultural differences, and general points of view. As I'm about to cover, a respectful workplace can improve morale, help attract and retain employees, create a safer work environment, and impact the bottom line. Improve morale. A welcoming and respectful workplace improves employee morale, job satisfaction, and productivity. In a 2019 poll, four in 10 people said civility at work improves their work morale and increases their loyalty to their employer. And nearly as many, about 36%, said civility at work improves their quality of work. Here are some more stats. According to the Society for Human Resource Management, also known as SHRM, Employees identified respectful treatment of all employees at all levels in the top five leading contributors to job satisfaction. The Harvard Business View has reported that 80% of employees treated uncivilly spend significant work time thinking about that bad behavior, and 48% deliberately reduce their effort. This creates a distracted and dissatisfied workforce, which is not a good thing, especially on a construction site. Attract and retain employees. Employees who feel respected are more grateful for and loyal to their employers, reducing turnover. Nearly 25% of employees say they quit a job due to an uncivil workplace. Additionally, 87% said workplace incivility has an impact on their work performance. And of that 87%, 45% expressed a desire to quit, and 33% actually discouraged others from working at the company. We know the construction industry relies heavily on word of mouth and referrals, so you want to keep that in mind, the negative impact a disrespectful workplace can have on that recruitment strategy. Organizations seen as positive places to work will always have a competitive edge because they can attract and retain highly skilled employees. This can help reduce rec recruitment costs. In that AGC survey, 63% of signatory contractors indicated they did not use unions or for at least 25% of their workforce. Unless the recruits were by word of mouth, the contractor likely has to use more time and resources to find additional employees. The respondents also said that a positive work environment is one of the most successful ways to attract and retain a diverse workforce. So not only will a respectful workplace help attract employees, it can help you keep the ones you have. Safety. Having a respectful workplace creates a safer work environment. Employees who respect one another can more easily focus on their work, meaning fewer mistakes and workplace injuries. We spoke earlier how an uncivil workplace can be distracting. When someone is distracted while performing work tasks, it can lead to an increased risk of injury. The cones on this slide represent data from studies by the Queen's School of Business and by the Gallup Organization. These studies found that disengaged workers had 49% more accidents, 60% more errors and defects, and 37% higher absenteeism. Also, when employees feel comfortable approaching a coworker or bringing up a problem to a supervisor, these safety issues can be addressed quickly, thereby preventing a potential workplace injury. The bottom line. Now let's take a look at the dollar and cents. Workplace culture has the greatest impact on allowing harassment to flourish or in preventing it. Respectful workplaces tend to have fewer harassment and discrimination issues, which saves time and money by avoiding fines and legal fees. In 2015, the EEOC alone recovered $164.5 million for workers alleging harassment. 
The Harvard Business View has stated that managers at Fortune 1000 firms spend the equivalent of seven year, weeks a year dealing with the aftermath of incivility. Workplace harassment affects all workers. These legal costs are only the tip of the iceberg. Its true cost includes decreased productivity, increased turnover, and reputational harm. All of this is a drag on performance and the bottom line. So the impact on productivity. Nearly everybody who feels disrespected responds in a negative way. About half deliberately decrease their effort or lower the quality of their work, and many will leave. These disengaged employees result in more than $300 billion in lost productivity just in the US annually. The impact on recruitment and retention. As mentioned earlier, a respectful workplace improves an, an employer's ability to attract and retain employees, which reduces recruitment and training costs. The average cost of turnover is 20 to 30% of the departed employee's annual salary. Now that's a good chunk of change you could be saving. Now Asela will provide some strategies to improve workplace culture on job sites. All right, this is Isela Citlali Gomez here. And as Alexis mentioned earlier, I'm the contract compliance specialist for District 1 and District 2. In other words, northern Minnesota. So if you ever do work in Bemidji or Duluth, you will most likely be interacting with me. Uh, as Alexis mentioned, these are strategies outlined on the Respectful Workplace Guide that you received the other day. Hopefully, you had the chance to review that one pager. And if you did, you may have noticed that the strategies are organized by first foundational aspects, then immediate actions, and lastly, some long-term strategies. They're going to be obviously more fleshed out today. I do want to remind everyone online that you can submit your questions throughout the presentation. We have someone going through those throughout, uh, and we'll have time to respond to the questions later. So don't feel you have to wait until the end to submit it. So the first of our foundational strategies uh, is the platinum rule. Most people have heard of the golden rule, which is treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, we encourage you to consider instead the platinum rule, which is treat others the way they want to be treated. Why is this important? Respect is different for different people. Uh, in particular, it's tied to what an individual expects and how it makes them feel personally. Norms do vary by culture, generation, and gender, as well as industry and organization. So as companies make efforts to diversify their workforce, this is incredibly important to keep in mind all the time. Definitions and displays of respect will vary, so it's no surprise that it looks different in law enforcement versus an office setting. Then you go to a project site, it's going to look different than it is in the medical field. So the first of several opportunities to reframe the conversation and the approach uh, is in the realm of workforce goals and diversity. Talk about the workforce goals as valuable, not obligatory. For those who don't know, the goals are set by the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, or MDHR, and they vary by region across the state. So they look different in the metro versus Rochester versus Fergus Falls. And the goals are exactly what they're named, goals. Uh, goals that enhance the value and the culture of your company. Research shows that companies with more diverse workforces perform better financially. So you can see on the slide that gender diverse companies are 15% more likely to outperform their peers. And ethnically diverse companies are 35% more likely to do the same. In that same vein, it is important to reframe the workforce goals and your company's efforts to diversify as a way that your company is actually strengthening itself rather than those concepts becoming a source of resentment. Employees at diverse companies are more engaged and they are happier. 
And if they are happier, they will probably stay longer, which means lower recruitment and training costs. This obviously is going to have an impact on employee relations and turnover. Anecdotally, MnDOT has heard from contractors who have achieved a healthy diversity and then are consequently able to use employee referrals as their primary recruitment tool. This is a no-cost recruitment strategy. When your workforce is diverse, your company will receive referrals from multiple communities instead of one or two. Another benefit, greater team innovation, creativity, and problem solving due to different perspectives and acknowledged individuality. We know that in construction, you have to follow MnDOT specifications and various federal regulations. We know that. However, there is room for innovation in areas such as team efficiency and problem solving. So this is something where you can really tap into the increasingly diverse workforce that you are getting because of all the great good faith efforts that you're doing. A Deloitte study of three large Australian companies found that when employees think their company is committed to diversity and they feel included, there is an 83% increase in their ability to innovate. Furthermore, a diverse workforce means you are meeting the company's responsibility to the public on publicly funded projects. First and foremost, the workforce goals are about being inclusive. It's about making intentional efforts to address disparities in the industry and increase representation of the diverse communities of Minnesota. Another opportunity to reframe Talk about what you can do versus only what you cannot do. The EEOC, or Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, says that too often workplace harassment initiatives focus solely on how to define and respond to illegal behavior. I want to note that it is still necessary to specify what employees cannot do, such as discriminate or harass. This is required by law. You need to be doing this. You need to be emphasizing this all the time within your company. And at the same time, the EEOC also says that prevention programs that use a positive values-based approach can be far more effective in shaping behavior than the consequence avoidance focus of traditional anti-harassment training. Telling employees about actions that violate policy places focuses on what not to do it's much more effective to say our organization is a great place to work. Here is how we respect and support each other so that we can all do our very best. This action-oriented message engages and empowers all employees to create a respectful and safe workplace culture. I do want to stress that respect does not require extra time. It is about how something is conveyed, your tone, and nonverbal communication as much as your written and verbal communication. Reframe employee feedback. We often hear from contractors that they aren't receiving any complaints from employees, even though they've been making a ton of efforts, particularly recently, to make the complaint process more known and accessible. So consider this approach if that's happening for you. Provide a mechanism for employees to share suggestions and solutions not just complaints. Uh, put it in a handbook. A lot of companies already have an employee manual that they distribute when they hire new folks or they give it out to everybody when they make revisions to it. Include an avenue in there for employees to talk about potential suggestions that they have. And review it every year. Don't just throw it in there and assume that people will, will see it. Make sure that you're allocating time to discuss it. And make it periodically part of toolbox talks and really, it's important to follow through on good suggestions. Why is that important? If an employee comes with, to you with a suggestion, make sure you follow up because that will build rapport with them, that can increase trust, and that can have a positive impact to the point that they might end up sharing with you a personal experience that happened or something that they witnessed. And that then becomes an avenue to hear about some of the complaints on site. Now we're going to shift into some of the immediate actions that you can do. Employee talks or toolbox talks, which I mentioned a second ago, 
A second ago, as some companies call them, have conversations with your employees about respectful workplace. So even though I said, you know, this, these are some things that you need to put in your handbook, don't only throw it in the handbook and never review it or discuss it. Since respect can look and mean so many different things, it is vital to engage with your employees. So you will need to create group norms. Dialogue with your team about expectations. Set the tone. Not everybody has had conversations on this topic, or maybe they have, but not in the workplace. So it is really important that you set up that space so that the conversation about respect is respectful in and of itself. On the slide on the left-hand side, you'll see a list of potential topics you can include in these toolbox talks. Equal employment opportunity, perhaps your company's non-discrimination policy, framing respectful workplace as a safety issue. On the right-hand side, you'll see some tips for how to have these conversations. Decide who to talk to on your team. Make sure you're selecting the right time and place, right? Maybe at the, uh, at the end of the day and it was a 14-hour 14, 14 workday is not the best place. And listen to understand, not to solve. Leadership. Start the conversation amongst people at the top. Have regular discussions regarding EEO topics, including respectful workplace. This goes beyond simply providing top leadership a copy of the company's equal employment opportunity statement. This slide shows a list of potential topics to discuss at already scheduled meetings. Be intentional. Give the conversation a meaningful amount of time on an agenda. Some of these topics could look like the complaints that are coming in. Uh, what are they? Have they been addressed? Have they been responded to within a prompt period of time? Uh, EEO discussions conducted with staff on site or elsewhere. There's a variety of opportunities and topics to discuss amongst leadership. Commitment from top leadership, including the CEO or president, to create a diverse and inclusive workforce is vital to creating lasting change. Employees are far more likely to report having positive views on diversity and inclusion when the president or CEO delivers frequent diversity messages to middle managers and folks throughout the company. In other words, the messaging needs to come from the top. Leaders need to be role models for civility. If supervisors are expected to make efforts to maintain a respectful workplace and the vice president of the company is doing the exact opposite, you should address that ASAP. Evaluate and reward civility during performance reviews. Include metrics on interpersonal skills and emotional competence. If you don't already have an annual performance review process in place, uh, you should, and you should include EEO and respectful workplace within that yearly evaluation. Just a side note, EEO, uh, as part of the performance review of particularly supervisors, by the way, is required. We in civil rights in the contract compliance unit look at this during our annual compliance reviews. So if you are a contractor who's been through one of those, you know that this is something that we look at. So this is an opportunity to make sure that you are uh, reviewing your processes and making sure you're in compliance. Last but not least, provide the necessary time and resources to be effective. If the president tasks the HR manager with recruiting for a diverse workforce, make sure you give that person the time to attend career fairs and make contacts in the community. Accountability and no tolerance. The EEOC's Select Task Force on the Study of Harassment says this, harassment in the workplace will not stop on its own. It's on everyone to be part of the fight to stop workplace harassment. We cannot be complacent bystanders and expect workplace cultures to change themselves. We all have a role to play in stopping inappropriate behavior. In this vein, many companies have heard of what's called an own your zone policy. So this is companies will tell their employees that, okay, even though you're not operating this particular piece of equipment, if you see it left out and turned on or in a space where it's not supposed to be, you're also holding that other employee accountable for speaking up about it. Consider including respectful workplace as part of own your zone policy. If you see something happening on site or if you hear about it, someone being disrespectful or discriminatory towards a coworker, encourage them 
to speak out about it, to reach out to a supervisor or perhaps your company's EEO officer. Uh, bystander intervention training is also a way to increase accountability, and Byron will talk more about this later. No tolerance or zero tolerance policy, as some companies refer to it. This is a policy stating that discriminatory and harassing conduct in the workplace will not be tolerated, and violators will be subject to appropriate discipline up to and including termination. Warning though, zero tolerance, if that is what your company calls it, may be misleading and potentially counterproductive. Essentially, it is the same thing as a no tolerance policy, but language does matter. Uh, what's important is that the disrespectful behavior is not tolerated and that it will be punished appropriately. While it is important for employers to communicate that absolutely no harassment and discrimination or discriminatory conduct will be tolerated, be careful to explain what zero tolerance or no tolerance means because zero tolerance may inadvertently convey a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, so again, remember the discipline must be proportionate to uh, what actually happened. Uh, it may end up contributing to employees under-reporting instances. An anti-harassment policy. So the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission recommends that your anti-harassment policy generally include the following six items. A clear explanation of prohibited conduct. Please include examples. Vagueness in this area uh, can perhaps cause more confusion. Two, clear assurance that employees who make complaints or provide relation, information related to a complaint or witnesses will be protected against retaliation. There will be more on retaliation later. A clearly described complaint process that provides multiple accessible avenues of making a complaint. So if your only method is that employees must report to their supervisor or report a complaint to their supervisor, what happens if the complaint is about that supervisor, right? So make sure that there are at least multiple people that can be the ones receiving complaints. Four, assurance that the employer will protect the confidentiality of harassment complaints to the extent possible. People wanna know that if they make a complaint, it's not gonna be immediately uh, spread across the company. Uh, a complaint process that provides a prompt, thorough, and impartial investigation. If someone brings forth a complaint in May at, towards the beginning of a construction season, don't wait until August to make the first follow-up to that employee. Even if you have been looking into it, it is important to stay in communication with the person who provided the complaint. And six, assurance that the employer will take immediate and proportionate corrective action when it determines that harassment has occurred. So again, make sure that you're being prompt and that you are being uh, intentional about the discipline. And with that, I will pass it over to Byron. Good afternoon. This is Byron Millay. I am the contract compliance lead and I cover the Metro and I will walk you through uh, the last handful of strategies here before we get to any questions that you all might have. Uh, just a reminder, please feel free to submit questions at any time and we will answer them at the end. Uh, so the first strategy I'm gonna touch on is related to retaliation and contractors should take steps to ensure that there is no retaliation against employees who make complaints either formally or informally. And we know that guarding against retaliation on site can be challenging, so it is very important that you have buy-in from your field supervisors, because those supervisors are the ones that must be vigilant and aware of what retaliation could look like on site. And you can see in the box on the slide um, some examples of what retaliation on the job site might look like. One is uh, moving, being moved off of a core crew, Another is being given odd jobs or not being trained in the way that others are on site, being made to feel like an outsider generally, and then early layoff and termination. 
And I want to note that early layoff and termination can, of course, be uh, decisions made for justifiable business reasons, um, but they can constitute retaliation if they are uh, an employee is uh, laid off early or terminated in response to their own complaint. So please be aware of that. So in order to get the buy-in that you need from supervisors, company leadership, something Isela touched on earlier, uh, it is important that company leadership communicates expectations clearly and regularly, um, specifically emphasizing that employees will not be retaliated against and that those who do uh, are involved in any type of retaliation uh, will be disciplined appropriately. And in 2016, uh, in an EEOC study of harassment in the workplace, uh, the EEOC cited, cited two studies showing roughly 70% of employees experiencing harassment do not talk, uh, do not talk to their supervisor, manager, or union rep about the harassing conduct. And the EEOC also noted that employees do not report harassing behavior for fear of, <clears throat> excuse me, reactions to the claim, including disbelief, inaction, being blamed for reporting the behavior, social retaliation, and professional retaliation. And the next uh, strategy I want to touch on is exit interviews. <clears throat> so contractors can conduct exit interviews with staff that have decided not to return for the following season or have quit during the season. And the goal of this type of interview is to find out why the employee left and their feelings towards your company in general. So these interviews can give contractors bits of information they might not be able to get otherwise about the on-site work environment because employees who have left your company have a reduced fear of retaliation from your company. And it is recommended that if you do these interviews, you do them via phone rather than sending a survey electronically or uh, a paper copy. <clears throat> and contractors should also create a process for taking action on any good feedback that they receive. And then uh, according to a Harvard Business Review article, uh, they noted that delaying these types of interviews by at least two weeks can yield a truer picture of the employee's feelings about your company. So it is important to wait a little bit before um, conducting these interviews with departed employees. And a firm that helps uh, companies create these types of interviews has actually found in its work that waiting two weeks after an employee's departure can change interview answers by as much as 40%. So again, um, important that if you're carrying these out to get the best answers, um, wait a couple weeks before um, conducting those interviews. <clears throat> okay, and we're going to switch gears here to EEO officer knowledge and capacity. Um, obviously, it's, it's important that we continue to build uh, knowledge and capacity for EEO officers and HR professionals uh, in general in the construction industry. One way to do that, obviously, is by attending uh, webinars or trainings like this one. Uh, the Department of Human Rights also has free webinars available occasionally, and the EEOC does as well. Um, and both of those agencies also have a lot of helpful other, other helpful resources that you can access online. Um, I'm going to touch on the meetings and the second bullet point a bit later, as well as uh, employment resource groups at the fourth bullet point a bit later. So we'll focus on the third bullet point at the moment. Uh, building relationships with community-based training organizations obviously has uh, benefits for your recruitment efforts, but it has benefits that go beyond that as well. And one is uh, related to training feedback. So your company can provide feedback to these training organizations to help them improve the programs that produce the trainees that you hire because more prepared trainees will be more likely to be retained uh, by your company and onboarded easier by your company and hopefully retained within the industry as a whole. And then the second benefit is retention feedback. So you may be able to tap into the knowledge of some of these training organizations, especially the ones that have been very successful and have high graduation rates to see what strategies they're using to ensure that trainees make it through the, tr the whole training program and graduate and find employment, because some of these strategies could be effective for your organization's own retention efforts related to your new hires and your apprentices who are new to the industry. 
And then finally, conducting regular job site interviews to ensure a non-discriminatory work environment is actually required under federal regulations. So if that's something your company is not currently doing, um, please begin doing that periodically. And for those who are conducting these types of inspections, it's likely that your on-site supervisors are conducting those. Um, however, we do encourage HR staff and EEO officers to do these as well. Um, they can benefit from visits to job sites by getting a better understanding of the work environment and the culture most employees experience on their job sites. And it's important if you're gonna be out on site doing these types of visits and inspections to interview workers individually to inspect the restrooms for any inappropriate graffiti and to use a standardized template form um, so that you have consistent inspections each time you do these uh, site visits. So we're gonna switch gears here to career development. According to the 2019 2020 AGC survey, contractors stated that providing one career development and training opportunities and two mentoring are some of the more effective tactics used to attract and retain talent. And so we'll start with mentorships as the first topic here. Mentorships are important because they provide for enhanced knowledge transfer, especially of experience-based and undocumented knowledge and skills. And as baby boomers retire, something your company is probably preparing for or experiencing already, it will be critical for construction companies to create formal knowledge transfer processes like mentorship programs. And we encourage contractors to create their own comprehensive mentorship programs which could include incentives for mentors and a process for getting feedback from the apprentices who are being mentored about their experience within the program. So the box on the right-hand side of the slide is a list from a research paper that provided apprentices who had been mentored with a list of 50 traits to choose from to select uh, characteristics they felt made an effective mentor. And as you can see, the top 10 includes some traits that would be intuitive, like a willingness to listen and share knowledge, but some that may be less intuitive too, uh, like a willingness to provide negative feedback. And that type of trait is really about providing constructive criticism because apprentices do acknowledge that they need to learn how to do the work correctly in order to have successful careers in the industry. And there are typically two uh, potential areas for mentorship on construction sites. One is an apprentice mentorship where apprentices are being mentored by uh, more experienced coworkers, usually a journey level employee uh, who's helping them become accustomed to the industry to learn and hone their skills and the journey level person or the mentor serving as a role model during that training. And then the second uh, type of mentorship is a pathway to promotion. So this is a situation where a four person would mentor a journey level person to assist them in their career advancement, training them on how to successfully plan and execute jobs as a leader on site, as well as advising them on how to be good mentors themselves. So we're gonna stay on this topic of pathways for promotion a little bit. Uh, Contractors should be intentional about creating these types of pathways for promotion and make sure that they are open to everyone within the company. You can begin formalizing your promotion process by formalizing your promotion process. We have found through our compliance reviews that many contractors do not conduct formal interviews for promotions. They choose instead to rely on past performance and recommendations from other supervisors. Those are certainly important ingredients in any decision-making process, but allowing for structured interviews will make the process more objective. It's also recommended that someone not involved in the hiring process review the hiring decision for any potential bias that may have occurred. One idea we'd like to offer is to set aside time during your annual all staff meetings or your annual safety meetings to meet with employees interested in promotions to discuss what it takes to be promoted, the expectations of the work they'd be doing, the nature of the work, et cetera. And this way contractors can better gauge who is interested and willing to take time to learn about any promotional opportunities. Contractors could even go a step further and set internal goals to diversify leadership. If you know, for instance, that you have supervisors nearing retirement 
or your company is growing, you may be able to set some near-term goals for your company to develop or recruit people of color or women for eventual promotion. Diversifying the leadership level of your company will undoubtedly give you more credibility in your company's recruiting and retention efforts, especially those efforts related to people of color and women. And then on a similar note, and at this point I want to be clear on, contractors may be aware that supervisory position like on-site supervisory four-person positions are not included in the project workforce numbers that MnDOT uses to track progress towards the workforce goals for people of color and women. This fact should never be used as a reason for not promoting an otherwise qualified employee uh, to a supervisory position. So again, just to be clear, in a situation where a person of color or a woman is qualified and interested in a promotion, it is not an excuse to say that that person should not be promoted because you would lose the workforce hours uh, related to the project goals that we track. We don't have any indication that that is happening on our projects, but I did want to be clear about that point. So another strategy that contractors can take is to emphasize the importance of respectful workplace with their union partners. So start discussing this uh, more directly with the union reps themselves. Ask them how it's being discussed during union training and how the union views these types of trainings. MinDA OCR understands that unions require a training called Pro 10, which does include some respectful workplace and diversity training among several other topics. There are some additional options or supplements available that the contracting community may consider discussing with their signatory unions. One of those is called by bystander intervention training. So this is a training recommended by the EEOC as a, in the form of a training called It's On Us. And it's been used to combat sexual violence on school campuses. This training focuses on not being a complacent bystander and acknowledges the roles that everyone plays as coworkers and supervisors. Uh, to stop harassment in the workplace. It also provides different and specific options for taking action, acknowledging that this is not a one-size-fits-all problem, and that the messaging in this training would help individuals understand that intervening is not only socially acceptable, but also encouraged. Uh, an example of this type of training is the Be That One Guy program established by the Iron Workers Union, which is a training that enlists male iron workers who are not afraid to speak up and tell a bully to knock it off on a job site. So this is the last topic uh, we'll touch on before we have a couple wrap up slides and then get to your questions. And this topic is employee resource groups or ERGs. So you can, as a company, encourage your employees to establish and organize ERGs within their union. Uh, the definition of an employee resource group is a group of employees who join together in their workplace based on shared characteristics or life experiences. And a local example of this would be the women's group at the Local 49. You may have heard these groups referred to uh, in other places or other trainings you've been to as affinity groups, which are a little bit different because affinity groups are not tied to an organization and are more focused on social interaction. ERGs, on the other hand, are employee-led, have a formal connection with the organization, mutual employee and organizational benefits, a shared mission with the organization, and organizational support and accountability. And organizations can benefit from supporting ERGs because these groups can provide information that can assist the organization in its recruitment and retention efforts, including context for cultural issues that may come up, suggestions for workplace improvements, and leads on networks for tapping into for recruiting. And then I just want to touch on a couple myths here, um, some things that come up generally when we discuss ERG groups or employee resource groups. And the first one is that ERGs give some employees special privileges over others. 
The reality is that ERGs arise from a lack of networks and developmental opportunities for employees from backgrounds that may differ from the majority. And so employees from minority groups are generally more vulnerable to being excluded from information networks. And so ERGs can help them obtain that insider information they may not otherwise be able to get, which can help them in advancement opportunities and really even just being retained and feeling a part of the industry. And the second myth is that having special groups for certain employees actually furthers exclusion. The reality is that these groups often grow out of some employees' desire to connect with others who have similar background and experiences. And the ERGs can also advise organizations how to connect with employees who are often marginalized, which will ultimately expand inclusion for all. So really just getting at the idea that this is not a zero-sum game where more inclusion for one group means exclusion for another group. ERGs are built around the idea that inclusion for marginalized groups will ultimately increase inclusion for all. And so that wraps up the strategies we're going to cover today. We did want to leave you with a little bit of food for thought, just a few questions to stimulate your minds um, as we uh, end this webinar today and think about action items you can take individually and your company can take going forward from here. So the first question is, who do you need to get buy-in from at your company to improve workplace culture and how will you achieve that buy-in? So maybe you're an HR professional or an EEO officer and you need to set a meeting uh, with your leadership group maybe using the business case that Alexis went over at the beginning of this presentation uh, to pitch to them why this needs to be an elevated issue within your company. Or maybe you are a company leader yourself and you know that you need to get buy-in from your direct reports and folks further down the org chart because you acknowledge that this work cannot uh, be done well without full buy-in um, from other supervisors, especially on the job site. So think about who you need to get buy-in from. And then which strategies offered today can be implemented at your company? We know that not all the strategies offered today will fit for every company, uh, but we hope that you can pick out at least a few to implement uh, in, in your company. And then lastly, what actions can you take in the short term to begin having a conversation about improving workplace culture at your company? So even if you're working at a company where you feel has a, a relatively healthy workplace culture, I hope we can all agree that we, we must continue to improve everywhere on this issue. And so consider who you would need to set a meeting with or the conversations that you would need to have uh, to begin elevating this issue at your company. And then lastly, just a bit of a marketing plug for how you can be part of this discussion and other discussions going forward. So we have two meetings that we attend on a regular basis. Uh, the first one is the worksite cooperation meeting. Uh, that is the meeting where these types of conversations about respectful workplace began over a year ago um, and led to this webinar today. So if that's a topic you're interested in, this is a great meeting to come to. It's every month. Um, and the next meeting is March 12th, next week at the Urban League in Minneapolis. Contractors, uh, union reps, MnDOT, and some workers have attended as well. And we are willing to adjust meeting times uh, to accommodate, especially to accommodate worker participation, where we've got a lot of great feedback and perspective. And then the second meeting is results in transparency, which some of the contractors may be more familiar with. This meeting happens monthly. We review project workforce data, MnDOT also provides updates and reports and compliance reminders. And then contractors also discuss their own recruitment efforts, successes, and challenges. So there's something to be learned from your peers at this meeting as well. So that is all we have. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And we will take uh, a moment here to address any questions that came up. So I will pass this back over to Alexis momentarily. All right, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put that in the chat box so we can see that and we can address it. Um, I think the only thing I've seen so far is about the slides. And yes, we will be sending those out very soon after the presentation's done so you can have those.
and I'll give you just a Oh, and with the slides, um, in that email, we also have a link to a survey, and we would really appreciate if you'd take that. It's only five questions. It should take you like two, three minutes, so not too much time out of your day, but please fill that out for us. Thanks. Okay, a question about registering to attend these meetings. Um, you do not need to register, but if you want more info on where it is, um, you can send an email to any of us here at MinDOT, um, Asela, myself, or Byron, and we can get you details on how to come. You can just show up. And especially for the worksite cooperation me meeting, it's usually held around the same time, um, but some days or months we move the time to accommodate different people. So it's really a good idea just to check in with that one so we can get you on the email list for that. All right, well, if you don't have any other questions today, we'll let you go, but if anything comes up, feel free to give us a call or email. We're always here to help. All right, thank you.